Thanks for taking the time to listen to our latest content here on the Blood Red channel. Guy here with just a quick message. Do you want the very latest Liverpool FC news directly into your inbox? Well then sign up to our daily LFC newsletter, which will bring you the breaking news and big events from around Anfield. To subscribe, just go to bit.ly forward slash LFC newsletter. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash LFC newsletter. Or click the link in the description of this podcast and pop in your email address. It really is that simple. That link once more bit.ly forward slash LFC newsletter. Well, thanks for your time and on with the podcast. This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello, welcome to the Blood Red Podcast. I'm Guy Clark as we get set to talk about all of the latest Liverpool FC talking points, including the step up in preparations for the return of Premier League action as Liverpool were once again back in action at Anfield for the first time in three months as beat Blackburn Rovers 6-0 at Anfield with uh, a number of goal scorers catching the eye. We will talk about a couple of those, plus much more besides joining me to do all of that. Ian Doyle, Sean Bradbury and Kiever O'Neill. Team, how are we all? Sound, yeah. Yourself? Not so bad, not so bad. Yeah, all, all good here. And uh, Kiva, we, we quite like the uh, the backdrop you've, you've gone on today. Yeah, well, there's a reason for this. Maria Pio on there. Uh, my mum has been cooking all day, literally. So cornbread she's making. Don't know why. She said she had it when she was she worked on cruise ships years ago, and she had it then. All the Americans apparently love it. So she's been a busy bee this afternoon. So I've had to I've had to uh, set up camp in the living room, nice little backdrop instead of my usual passport photo looking white wall. But yeah, I've oh, said so this before. But... Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> letting the side down here, but I'm going to try and change the subject quickly to get away from my backdrop. We need to get Maria Pio on a podcast. Every time you mention her, it's a, it's a new little story. So It is always a crazy little story. She's, she's before... just nipped out as well, so hopefully um, no interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see. We are live on YouTube. For those who do join us on there, if you want to leave a question in the comment section as we do go through... We will tr- try to get to them, but we do have an awful lot on the agenda. The 6-0 win over Blackburn Rovers. Comments from Loris Karius and potentially his future at Anfield. We'll also touch on Marco Gruich before finally talk about a certain former Liverpool playmaker who turns 28 today. But Doily, come to you first of all on that game at Anfield. Three months on from playing Atletico Madrid at Anfield. There was another side for Liverpool to take on. They'd all the interest squad friendly. But a championship side, Blackburn Rovers, came to town yesterday. Yeah, an actual game of football where we could. Admittedly, we couldn't watch it as such, but we were able to watch some highlights later on in the evening. So it was nice to see Liverpool's players actually strutting the stuff at Anfield. Um, interesting, of course, there was nobody there, no fans, I should say, because that's what they're going to have to get used to. It was uh, You could see there were some clips of Jurgen Klopp on the going to say on the bench, but he was actually you know on some slightly distant chairs on the sidelines along with of the coaching staff and the, a lot most of the substitutes were sat in the in the stands away from each other. I mean anyone who's watched any of the Bundesliga highlights or or the live games there will know exactly what to expect. And I think that's what we're gonna to have to get used to. But in terms of the actual action on the pitch, you know, six nil, it couldn't have gone much better for Liverpool. There were obviously one or two players who who weren't playing, the likes of Mohamed Salah and Andy Roberts and Divika Rigi, Zerdan Shakiri and uh, and Adrian, they weren't involved. I believe that Salah and Robertson had, you know, minor issues that should be okay. Adrian's a little bit more, they're not entirely sure there. And Shakiri hasn't played the actual game of football since I think it's January the 11th, I think, at Tottenham. So in that respect, there was you know, one or two minor concerns. But in terms of the performances, you look at Naby Kate had a, certainly when he played, he, he seemed to have a good game. Uh, Takumi Minamino, he weighed in with a goal and an assist. And their two players in Liverpool will be expecting to, with such a short turnaround of games that Liverpool plays it nine games in 36 or 37 days to finish the season, they're going to have to rely on a, a lot of these fringe fringe players or squad players, players who haven't played as much. And for, for me, I mean, in particular, I bear in mind, joined in January to much fan for, didn't get a lot of action, which is understandable given that Liverpool have been playing so well this season. And then just as he started to become a little bit acclimatised, I think he was involved in two or three games in a run. Season stops for three months. So for him, Coming over to you know to a foreign country, you know, having to try and integrate into the squad would have been difficult doing it from his house, presumably by himself, or certainly not with any of his 
of his teammates. So hard for him, but in some ways, the you know the, the little mini preseason that they're calling it of the last couple of weeks could have helped in that respect because he'll have been working with the players closely, with his teammates closely, I should say, with the coaching staff, doing things that they wouldn't have been able to do if it had been in the middle of the season. So it's helped him in that respect. But you know, Minamino Keita, they were two highlights from the game itself. I mean, anyone who's seen it, Sadio Mane looks very, very sharp. And there were one or two others who, who impressed. Jordan Henderson was was knocking the ball out. Alice at some point raced about forty yards out of his goal to make a tackle. So it's good to see that they're all they're all kind of reverting to type straight away. So all in all, there was one minor issue in terms of an injury for Alex Oxley Chamberlain. It looks as though he's going to be okay. He was taken off with a, a knock his ankle. You know, there's not there's not one to go. Was it nine days before the season starts now? So I think everybody's getting excited to see it return. And that was uh, it was a big step yeah, yesterday. Yeah, Sean, just on those impressed, fully said Minamino and Naby Keita, two of the players to really impress. And I suppose part of that as well from the highlights we've been able to see was it seemed Oxlade Chamberlain played wide on the right hand side. Doesn't play as high in advance as Mo Salah does. And Naby Keita and Minamino both sort of seem to play in almost those kind of half spaces linking up and threading through threading through a few opportunities for Sadio Man. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, as as Ian says, it's a bit of a tricky one to to truly assess, given that we're only going on the the ten minute highlight package. I mean, maybe you know, maybe six 0 was flattering. Maybe maybe Blackburn were banging on the door all game, and you know, Liverpool got six on the break. I'm not sure, but but no, it, it certainly looked good. And as as we say, the the kind of fringe figures almost, and some of the guys with something to prove, seem to really step up in the first half and play well, and and, and that's very encouraging. And all the names you mentioned, Guy, certainly from the highlights package, looks good. But Keita, Keita looked really, really sharp. And yeah, there was there was one uh, particular instance. I think it was not not the, the shot that led to a goal, but it was but it was one where uh, um, Keita put Ox in with one of those little balls where he just seemed to see something different and find find a little angle and you know find a little way and a route into the box that I think a lot of other players wouldn't find. And yet yeah, to, to kind of see him gearing up it to that form at, at a very timely point with, with the restart um, coming next week is, is very encouraging. Yeah, it was almost like I think this, the the team over in a situation. Just to kind of briefly mention it, I think is you know not as cast a shadow <laughs> over <laughs> the T word and the W word. But I think the, the, the two things are you know you, you now kind of look to the fringe players to say, well, go on then. You know, this, this situation was clearly unfolding and something Liverpool wanted couldn't happen because of very legitimate and understandable reasons with the you know coronavirus pandemic and. Financial uncertainty. I think you know we've we've obviously covered that, and that's all fair enough. But I I do wonder whether Klopp's kind of almost challenged the the players on the fringes. You know whether he's actually said it to them. I don't know. But like it it almost looked in that first half like Minamino, especially as Doyle said, was someone who was playing with a bit of a point to prove. Got his goal, got his assist, which is great to see. And um, yeah, as, as we've mentioned, Kate looked good. But I think the other side of the awareness situation is he obviously would have been someone who would have been an option. Not necessarily for now, but for the future. So, with with the financial uncertainty cloud and the situation, obviously you're looking to the youngsters to try and step up, and that was the thing from from the highlights package that, that really stood out to me in that second half. Like the kids were were superb. There was that one goal, wasn't it? The one that Clarkson scored. Where I think it was like Elliot Elliot played it to Clarkson, little little one two with Hoover, who somehow was was in the box up front. I'm not quite sure like, how how that situation came about, but then yeah, Clarkson took his took his goal really well and finished. So. So yeah, I think you've got to put it into context, haven't we? It's a it's a warm up game, and, and and that's all it is. Albeit against you know reasonable quality of opposition, you know mid table, decent championship side, and, and as we say, six 0 is never never a bad scoreline to come away with after ninety minutes. But but yeah, I think fringe players were encouraging, youngsters were encouraging. I think those those young players have proved one thing we want to see in this little run of nine games to finish the season is a couple of those to get a chance. In a first team, you know, see someone like Elliot or Williams or Hoover or Clarkson with with nine or ten first team players around them and see what that's like. Is that going to be the idea of testing ground and opportunity for them, Kiva, to bring in these young players? In terms of when you look at obviously how Liverpool are going to try and integrate the youngsters under 23s football doesn't have the biggest crowds, and then you've got effectively what are going to be training matches that have points up for grabs with them. Trying to blood some of these young players in, it's not going to be a daunting experience all of a sudden coming into a stadium of 50,000 people. 
No, that's the point I was going to make. I think the youngsters are really benefiting from, you know, it looked yesterday in the highlights reel, albeit the nine minutes that we got, that they seem to just, you know, be thriving without that sort of pressure. Not that they wouldn't dream of playing in front of the Anfield crowd, because that's, of course, their dream, you know. Every young player, that's what they want to do, and a lot of them accomplished that this season in, in the Cup games. Um, I think they were playing similar to Minamino and Cater without sort of any pressure, and I feel like the crowd does add to that. As soon as Cater, you know, misplaces a pass, the crowd get on his back a little bit. It's not just him, it'd be Minamino as well. Any sort of player who isn't performing, it's, that's always been the way of the cop and the way of Liverpool fans and any ground around the country, really. I think, you know, fans are always going to berate the players and um and ah when there's, you know, a misplaced pass or, a, a you know, a mistake. So, you know, they've got every every reason to do that. And, you know, that always pushes the players on. But without that now, I think, you know, these players can um, definitely thrive, like I've said there, because there isn't that sort of pressure. And as you mentioned, you know, the under 23s have, you know, used to playing without any crowds, um, just usually Ian Doyle there, isn't it, Ian? And yeah, yeah just me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I definitely think that that, sh- that Sean yesterday, particularly that little move movement that Sean mentioned there for uh, Clarkson's goal, I thought, you know, they, they looked unreal. And I think as well what you saw there was the confidence that's rubbing off the older players onto these young players. Um, you know, now the football is coming back. And I think as well, they sense a chance here. This is a chance to, you know, get yourself in Klopp's good books and also earn yourself a Premier League winner's medal. You know, how many Liverpool players, young Liverpool players coming through, you, you think of the likes of, you know, Fowler, Gerrard, whoever it be. None of them, Owen, you know, Ballon d'Or winner, none of them got to even in the fair seasons, you know, have that opportunity to have a Premier League winner's medal. We've got like Harvey Elliott, Club World Cup win and stuff like that. So, you know, to win these medals, that sets a precedent then for the future. And in 10 years time, you'll be looking at hopefully Harvey Elliott's honours and it'll be a massive list, hopefully as well, Curtis Jones, um, you know, and the rest of the young lads. I think the, the future does look pretty bright in particular those sort of standout players Eco Williams's and you know it is really positive and I think you know fans are it's it now feels like pre-season but fans are gonna get a better look at these young players because it, it it's competitive where pre-season is competitive but it's you know it's not really is it where this you know points are up for grabs and you know you've got you've got a chance to to write your name in the history books and I think you know the the, these young players are deserving of that, but they definitely want to want to be given a, a winner's medal um, in the next few weeks. Yeah, definitely. And given the uh, the requisite number of games has dropped from ten to five over the last few years, totally, there is a good chance actually with five substitutes that a couple of these young lads might well be able to get themselves a winner's medal. I, I think it was even back on Monday's podcast you spoke about Leighton Clark and said he was a player that actually Liverpool do have high hopes for. Of course, he got a chance and he did show probably a, a central holding midfield player, but he got himself a goal and showed what he's all about. Yeah, who knew? I, I might actually know what I'm talking about every now and again. So uh, thanks, thanks for teeing that one up for me. Um, the other thing about that goal from Clarkson, it actually starts from Nico Williams. So the whole of the goal, all the way through, is a goal that was basically built at the academy. And I think the reason Hoover was that far up is I'm pretty sure Matip and Vandenberg were centre-backs at that point. LaRouche and Williams were at full-back. So Hoover had just been told, just go up and, you know, I think he was on the right wing at some point. But, you know, as Keeper just mentioned then, you've got the likes of Harvey Elliott and players like that. They've got every chance of getting the medal now that it's been, you know, moved down to five games. The only problem is that I think Liverpool only get a set number of medals. So there'll be the players who will get them and the coaching staff will get them. And I think it's up to Liverpool whether they want to strike a few more medals for whoever. I mean, if they want to give, you know, the, the local press who've been covering them all the way through the season a Premier League win, winners medal, then you know, it'd be great. That'd be, that'd be a really kindly gesture as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other thing as well, actually, about no fans, which keepers mentioned then, which actually can benefit Liverpool just in terms of finishing the season, is that we know from experience we've seen, say, when City ran away with the league, they played United in a home game, and the crowd. I'm not saying the crowd got on top of them, but. The, when matters went against them in that game, remember there was the infamous clip, wasn't there, of the fan who started crying 
even though City were like about 15 million points clear and not needed to win one of the last 10 games just because they'd lost to United. And that, that, that kind of little bit of pressure, Liverpool might now just be able just to get the job done straight away without... You know, look at look at the, the, the derby at Goodison, which we now know is going to be at Goodison next week. What's the reason that Liverpool find it difficult? It is because of Everton, but it's primarily because of the fans and the you know the way that the stadium is. Anybody who's been to Goodison knows it's a difficult ground to go to. If you're an away team and the home fans start getting either on your back or getting support in the, the, the Everton team. So that's something that Liverpool don't have to deal with now. And in the Bundesliga, people have been talking a lot about how home advantage hasn't counted for so much. But what's actually happened is the teams who have got the best players and the best squads, the deeper squads, are the ones that are winning most of the games simply because they, all the other kind of, you know, the incidentals, the things that could alter that, they're all gone now. There's no fans, all that kind of thing. The, the pressure isn't there. And obviously, absolutely nobody in the world wants there to be no fans. It wants there not to be no fans in the stadium. Everybody wants them there because that's the reason why people love football so much is because of the support. It's a good game, yeah, but it's made even better. It's made into a massive event by the people who go watching it. But in the short term, we know that there's going to be none there. And that will play in Liverpool's hands in terms of winning the Premier League. And as Kiva said, in helping these youngsters who are more... I mean, everybody starts off by playing football in front of nobody. So all of the players at some point in their careers will be used to it or have only experienced it. But these ones are still coming out of that kind of phase of their careers. So it, it won't bother them. It won't feel unusual to them. You know, because, you you know, Kiva's right. Uh, you know, when you go down to the academy and watch them, there's only like a couple of hundred there. But they do make themselves heard. And the players on the pitch aren't making any less effort because they know if they play well in those particular games, they've got a better chance of playing in the first team. So now they're going to be playing, hopefully, in the first team to have a better chance of then staying in the first team. So for them, the aim is still the same. Now, thanks to the substitutions, you know, I think, was it five substitutions are allowed from nine? You saw how many players were missing for Liverpool yesterday. We mentioned them. So you only have to have, like, very mind Liverpool played a lot of midweek games. Only a couple need to not be playing, and suddenly there's a very good chance that a lot of these players will be getting games, especially when you would assume Liverpool will have won the league. And the only thing that, say the only, but the thing they're going for then is that the points don't know how many they can get, whether they can break the record. And if you've got the rest of the players still playing at 100% or the maximum they can actually do, and they've got an aim, it's so much easier for youngsters to come in and, and, and make an impact because they know that they're not coming in in a completely false situation as opposed to how some people might say because of the reasons we've just mentioned about no fans and whatnot. Yeah, the youngsters don't have that kind of pressure, Sean. And one guy who's already been mentioned, Kiva referred to it as well with him, was is Navi Cater. Of course, he's had his comebacks from injury and this, that and the other. And it seems to be as much for him psychological battles when he comes back, if he can get through a 90 minutes, if he can get through a game unscathed with all of that, all those eyes on him, all of that pressure on him. Taking what we saw yesterday, he looks as though he's absolutely flourishing in a non-pressure environment. And hopefully that can really be the launch pad for him kicking on, staying fit and becoming a, a real key player. Because we saw in the, those early glimpses when he first joined the club, just what a crucial player he could potentially be. Yeah, he's, uh, he still baffles me a little bit as a player because you, you're right that the highlights were great. He obviously got his goal. There was a couple of really nice bits of skill. There was one lovely little drag back and... Uh, when he, he teed someone else up to, to run into the box. And as we said before, he, some of his angles are past and then just his vision is just it's just very, very different to most other players in the, in, in the Premier League and, you know, playing elite level football. He's, he is, he's clearly a player there. But I, I just think there will be a debate about Cater until he either starts playing out of his skin every week and bosses the league or, or just doesn't and, and maybe leaves. Because I, I always think back to that game earlier this season, West Ham, wasn't it, where... I, I, even after the game, when obviously he went off when Liverpool were, were trailing, and then Oxley Chamberlain came on and eventually won the game, and, and it kind of set off a bit of debate of well, a lot of the metrics and the, the, the stats about what Cater did with the ball were were very positive, and you know, on, on the one hand, there was there was a case to say he played well, but then I remember being there and just thinking we have, we have to make a change, and it has to be him that goes off. He's not playing that well. Other players are kind of you know. And on his back a little bit about you know his positioning and, and some tactical points and yeah I, I just think he's he's until we see the real case and I think you, you the point is exactly what you said he needs that run of games for for kind of everyone to get used to him really and and the the, the theory of navigator to become a, a kind of practical thing that that everyone 
kind of knows what to expect and maybe maybe that's part of it the levels of expectation i think that was that was something from from day one wasn't it and the, the fact that day one we had to wait a kind of year for that uh given the type of deal that brought him here so um yeah fingers crossed this 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 is the one where he's 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 treated this sort of break like a bit of a pre-season there's there's a clearly defined run of games where liverpool know what they want they know what they need um and hopefully like if, if liverpool can get the title wrapped up quite quickly within this run of nine games like you say, because often we can really see what he's made of. There is obviously that saying, yeah. Kiva, about some players that they're training players. You get to a ground, you see the team sheet, you think, why is the manager team? He never seems to really do it and show up consistently. And I'm not saying Navi Cater is that player, because when he first joined Liverpool, certainly, as I say, the home game, his debut against West Ham and away at Crystal Palace, he looked brilliant in, in those games. But away from that line right and the fans and the pressure on you do just hope that this can be the chance for him to kick on and, and show what he is all about yeah definitely and you know i've seen a few people on social media saying you know with liverpool missing out on on Werner possibly that um you know the there's maria Pio just interrupt and keep it quiet <laughs> get, get it on the pod go on live on youtube here <laughs> Um, working from home, the joy. Eh? So, so obviously, he can be like a new, a new transfer, a new signing for Liverpool. I feel. Um, I know that's so cliche, but I've seen a few people writing it, and you know, I think it's it is a real thing. You know, we saw it with Alex Boxley Chamberlain when he, you know, sadly had that injury. He was out for over the, just over a year, wasn't it? And he came back the next season. Then, just you know, brilliant, brilliant player, and I think he's been been like that for Liverpool. Naby Keita has shown so many glimpses. He's got his own, you know, we, we watched for those couple of years, didn't we? The year we signed him, we had to wait. And we were watching YouTube compilations of him. Everyone was watching them. I think there is a comp, there must be a Liverpool one out there because he's shown so many glimpses and moments of, you know, just class and skill. And you just kind of want to put all them together in a game and be like, just do it in the whole game and then just do it in the next game and the next game and the next game. And, you know, he has been so unlucky with injuries. I think it got to that Barcelona game um, with his away in Spain and obviously he picked up the injury and then he never quite recovered then, did he? And, you know, I think there was another injury after that. And, you know, I think he seems like a player who thrives off momentum. But I think he also looks like yesterday he's a player who could thrive off this sort of quieter environment, you know, sort of going back old school on the 23s, you know, there's no crowd there. Maybe we'll just thrive. Like him and Minamino looked amazing yesterday. And wouldn't it be good for Liverpool if they were sorted to come into their own at this time, you know, when fans are disappointed about um, transfers that maybe, you know, these players can be going forward, you know, Liverpool's sort of, new old signings because you know you looked at them yesterday and they look great in, in those moments we did stay. So I think if they both have a strong end to this season, then you know the next season, which will probably be starting about five minutes after that season, um, you know, you just want them to keep building these blocks because it's it was it was cruel on Katie that he did build them so high and we were all thinking, you know, this is this is a player we've got here. And then you know, he kind of fell down a little bit. But, you know, th there's definitely time and there's those nine games to just have those moments. Um, you know, it felt like in, in the last title race last season, there was a couple of chances he missed maybe to score. I think it might have been, I can't remember. There was a couple maybe West Ham away and, you know, different ones. And you felt like the moment sort of got away from him to be the hero. And if they would have been, you know, his name would have been in lights and, you know, everywhere, but, you know, he missed those opportunities, unfortunately. Um, but does not to say he won't score the winning title, the, the, the goal that wins the title, you know, wouldn't it be right fitting for the player then to start his, his new sort of, you know, just draw a line under what's gone before. And I think fans as well need to just have patience. I know it, it can be a couple of seasons and people can get a little bit, you know, fed up of one player or another. But I feel like support is, and love is the only thing that can really help in life and in you know football as well so i think i think i can say the thing about cater is that well, first of all we've got to remember they were playing blackburn yesterday so we can't get too carried away and he only played what was it first 45 or 60 minutes so we just need to you know we're all excited to see liverpool about playing again and it was great to see these players do what we know they can do but 
we'll have to wait until the actual action, the actual start yeah. starts uh, next week. The thing about Kate is that he just kept on getting injured at the wrong time. You know, it says keeper said then I've written this a few times. It's like the Barcelona game, he'd just been in the team and he scored against Porto in the quarterfinals and he'd had a few good games in the league. I think he scored at Southampton Adney uh, a bit earlier in the in April, and then the, that Barcelona came round game came round in the main, he got injured, went off, didn't play again that season. And then injured again just before he was about to play in the Super Cup final. And then he ends up coming back into the team, plays in the Club World Cup, sets up a goal for, for did he score? I can't remember whether did he score or he set one up for Salah. I can't remember. I think he may have scored actually in the first game um, against Monterey. Anyone want to help me on that one? No, no one can remember. No, so it feels like forever ago. Well, he certainly did something anyway. And, um, and then he got injured against, I think it was in the warm up, was it against Sheffield United or Wolves in the uh, in the New Year's? And then again, he's come back to Stan. I think he did. He had an okay game at, Nor uh, at Norwich. And then uh, you mentioned the West Ham game. And then he got injured again. And then he was injured when the when the league was suspended. So it's a big moment for him. The thing about Cater is, I think he may actually. I think it may actually. B, partly his body and also partly in his head, as Kiva's mentioned, because I remember there was a game last season at Burnley away where Liverpool had made loads of changes and Cater was in a two-man midfield, which is one where you'd think, oh, what's going on here? And it was probably one of his best games he's ever played for Liverpool. He totally he wasn't, wasn't, you know, wasn't bullied by Burnley. He just put himself about, got properly stuck in, you know, played the ball around really well. And had a very good game, and that's one. That's the first moment I thought, well, hang on, here's somebody who knows he can handle himself in English football. But injuries, a little bit of form, certainly self confidence and, and self belief. That's what's been bothering him. Yeah, it certainly does seem that way. Well, he's a player certainly wanting to prove himself this season. Another man who's come out with an interview and quotes that it seems as though he wants to prove himself and highlight and underline that he, he could have a future at Anfield. Doyle is. Loris Carrius, who's been speaking mm. with Transfer Market, and he, he's not been shy or standoffish about the fact that actually he does see a potential way in which he can remain a Liverpool player. Well, why wouldn't he? You know, he's back at Liverpool. He knows he's not going back to Besiktas now. He's burnt that. Well, he's not burnt those bridges. I suspect they did that for him or pushed him, pushed him towards the man, you know, handed him the match and said, get on with it. Um, but for, for Carrius, what, what else is he supposed to say? You know, he's come back to Liverpool. He's seen Adrian's there now. Keller has come in through. Karius has played in the Champions League final for Liverpool. So he knows, right, I've got more experience than certainly, not overall in terms of Adrian, but he's more experience playing in those bigger games. He's certainly got more experience than Keller as well. So I don't have a problem with him coming out and saying that. I know one or two fans on social media have just been going, oh, what's he talking about? What, what, what would you want him to say? Come back and say, yeah, I've got no chance of playing for Liverpool. I'm just going to stay here. At least he's saying what he said was, there's no point in me going to another club if I'm going to be number two, because I could be number two here and it's the best club in the world and they are the best team in the world. And I'm learning the best environment you could get for goalkeepers. Mentioned who he's working alongside. The likes of Alisson, who he obviously regards as one of the best goalkeepers in the world, despite the fact we've, <laughs> there's been some suggestion that he hasn't said that when in fact he actually did. Um, so for him, he's it, it's a bit of a no-brainer. It would be more weird if he came out and said, anything opposite to, to what he's actually said. At least it shows there's a bit of fight in him because we saw what happened to him after Kiev. And that was, that was you know, he's still, he, you know, he's, he's had it medically diagnosed that he had a concussion. And you can argue that, about how much of an effect that had or not. But the fact is, if someone's come out and said, yeah, you did get it and it's then, that definitely happened. And he only he'll know how much it affected him, to be honest. But it was a nightmare for him. And we saw, you know, when the, when they came back after the summer and he wasn't quite, you know, wasn't quite the same play. Whether or not you think Karras is good enough for Liverpool is a completely different question. Because he's still, he's still he's younger than Alisson. And I think people sometimes forget that he's only 26. But we've always heard that, you know, goalkeepers, when they get to 30, 31, 32, that's when they're coming into the prime. Well, he's got another four, five, six years till then. So I don't have a problem with him. I still, I must admit, I still don't think he'll play again for Liverpool. I think... They'll move him on in the summer. He still has two years left on his contract. And, and to be honest, him coming out and saying stuff like this actually will help Liverpool move him on because he's showing that he has got the appetite for, bat for a battle. And it can suggest that he's over everything that happened to him two years ago. Yeah, this, Sean, does Kia sort of cloud the judgment with Carriers? Because before all of that, he seemed to have jumped ahead of Mignolet as being the first choice at Liverpool 
a few people were behind him and backing him and wanting him to succeed, wanting him to be a brilliant goalkeeper. Mignolet yeah, 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 yeah. basically left now. Left now. And, and people did. People did. That's a horrible feedback there from somewhere. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. But Mignolet's now gone. And before he left, we always said, oh, Liverpool had the best second choice goalkeeper in the Premier League. Whether Adrian's that, I'm not entirely sure. But if Carrius was the number two, you, you would be saying, once again, Liverpool probably have the best goalkeeping department in the league, wouldn't you? Perhaps, but I don't think you can really get away from how seismic it, it was in, in Kiev. And that's not to just, that's not to dig him out. I just think that it, it was, I mean, in terms of like team sport, apart from an international thing, it, it's obviously very, very unfortunate what happened to him. And, you know, you can't really blame him in, 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 in any way because it wasn't, wasn't doing it on purpose. But that's the biggest stage in which you can make an error um, and, and, you know, ultimately let down the rest of your team. And, you know, he made two and, and it, and it did cost Liverpool. And I think I think everything Doyle said was spot on. No, it, it's great to see him on a personal level say these things because he's not said anything offensive. He's been very nice about Liverpool and he's backed himself. So I think to kind of pick himself up from from what happened there. And, you know, we all remember the scenes after that game. He, he was in tears and very quickly after the game was in the office that night. And, and we turned around the story. I think he spoke to TalkSport and, you know, effusively apologised for what happened. And it, clearly he was devastated. Um, and you know, so so for him to bounce back from that, I, th I think is good. And it's it's not been that easy for him in Turkey. He's had all sorts of issues, hasn't he? With I think two years on the bounce, there were difficulties with unpaid wages that had to get FIFA involved for to bring about resolution and all this type of thing. But he's played a lot of games, um, and and like you guys have said, he's he's still at a youngish age for a goalkeeper. There's, there's definitely somewhere he can he can now go on and hopefully build a decent career. You know, at another club. Yeah, on a personal level for him, it's good. I think, I think, but like Tony said, it's if he if he come back from this experience and was kind of downtrodden and was 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 not speaking with much confidence, what what club would look at him and think, oh, he's the man for us? You know, it, he's backing himself, and and it, and it's it's a plus for him, really, isn't it? That he's that he's gone through all this and he's on the biggest stage. He's he's had a he's had a horrendous night, and and he still does speak with some level of confidence. I think you absolutely need that if you're going to recover from that, and and maybe it does show like that the whole move to Turkey and getting out of the limelight, moving away from Liverpool, felt like a shot at rehabilitation. And despite the issues he's had, maybe it is, that is the case and he's come out the other side of it. But but again, like Ian said, I, I just don't see now how he could remain part of the Liverpool setup. But I, I think, and this this isn't to kind of do down his other teammates. Um, you know, I'm sure they're all <laughs> excellent guys who would welcome him back, in, back into the fold. But there just be something that you're back at the back of your mind after what he's been through and what's happened with him at Liverpool. Um, that yeah, I just you know his future isn't here, but but everything's happened on on a personal level and on a level in terms of attracting other teams. I think these comments are are really really good. For hope, hopefully for him to move on. Yeah, certainly. Well, uh, Nick's LFC has got in touch with us on YouTube. He's let us know that it was Cater who scored in the club one semi-final. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 I did check as well, but Nick's in touch. <laughs> Thanks for that, Nick. But also, Kiva says that a lot of people tend to forget that Carrius helped get Liverpool to a Champions League final. And he did come up big on a couple of occasions during that season for Liverpool. And on Sean's point, so much of goalkeeping is obviously the mental side of things. He does look as though he has finally got over, obviously, what happened in Kiev, come over that. And hopefully, whether it be at Liverpool or, or somewhere else, he goes on to have a, a good career. Yeah, look, after um, the final, he, he was mentally depleted, as you would be. I don't think, you know, that um, the social media side of things never helped him, you know, putting up, putting up a, a video in LA with drone footage and all, you know, cool music of him working out and it felt like some kind of Rocky montage and probably wasn't necessary um, in terms of fans are always going to sort of, you know, certain section fans are always going to blame him for that night and what happened. I don't think, you know, it just was tragic what happened and, you know, Liverpool lost the final. I think it's something that, you know, any final that we lose, it's always not going to sit well and you always look back and think, oh, you know, I was watching, I think, highlights the other week of the FA Cup final against Chelsea and Andy Carroll's sort of header that doesn't go over the line or does it. And, you know, so I think there's always going to be them moments where we look back and think, God, I wish we would have just got over the line there. And, you know, we didn't in Kiev, unfortunately. But then a year later, we did. You know, we won it. So 
we need to sort of just wash that out of our memories if we can. And I think that would sort of help him in his career. It's, it's something that's never going to leave him. But as the lads have said, you know, now he's sort of showing that mental fortitude that, you know, he, he he's sort of staking a claim and, you know, I could come back to Liverpool. And I think he's probably looking at Adrian and um, Lonergan and Kelleher and thinking, you know, I could probably do a job there if not win trophies because Liverpool are going to go on and win trophies next season as well. And he's probably thinking, well, wouldn't that sort of help my CV as well? And don't I deserve that after, you know, um, all what he's been through? But, you know, the, I don't think fans, that, like I've said, there, there'll be fans who never sort of accept them and never want to see him in a Liverpool shirt again. And, you know, that's unfortunate for him. But I think he's he's definitely got a future in football, but you just don't feel like it is at Liverpool, um, unfortunately for him. You know, I'd like to see him go on and, you know, you look at maybe like Brad Jones, how his career went after he left Liverpool and he went on to win the, the Dutch league. And, you know, maybe if he goes to a, a team, you know, quite capable in Europe or wherever it be and, you know, finds that and, you know, wins trophies, then maybe he can put to bed that, you know, horrific night, what it was. Because um, you do kind of feel he is a person, you've got to remember that and, um, you know, you should really just want to wish him all the best. And if Jurgen Klopp decides to keep him around next year, then you've got to support your manager and just think that, you know, he thinks that's the best move, then it is. And, you know, you don't know, he might struggle to find a club for him in the current climate. So, you know, Liverpool fans might have to get used to the idea that Loris Carriers will be around. But, you know, if he's showing this confidence, then maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, certainly. Well, he's someone who spent two seasons away from Anfield on, likewise, as Mark Gruwich. And, Doyle, I know you turned around some quotes from uh, the Hertha Berlin sporting director, Michael Preet, talking about, uh, Pretz, sorry, talking about um, Marco Gruwich and the development he's had as a player. And obviously, his stay at Berlin will come to an end at, at the end of this month. And then, I suppose, like Carrius, we wait to see if he's got a future at Anfield. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, he's it, it, an interesting one in the sense that he hasn't played for Liverpool for, what was it, that you just mentioned, two years, more than two years. So I'm not sure where, how he's going to end up for him because you got to bear in mind that he was, he was Jürgen Klopp's first sign as Liverpool manager. I think it was 5.1 million or something like that from Red Star Belgrade back in January 2016 when look at the teammates that he had then compared to the ones that he's coming back to now. And it's a completely different Liverpool squad. There's not many of them that remain so it, it's it's hard to say if you move. It could well be that with, I mean, Liverpool probably would have looked to sell him in the summer, if we're being perfectly honest. And they would be, we'd have been one of the several players they'd looked to get some money for. Now, whether or not they're now going to be able to do that with Hertha or any other team, because Hertha absolutely love him, even though he's, every time I watch him, he seems to get booked. So he must have, you know, I wonder how many, you know, he'd get booked every week in the Premier League at that rate. So he'd be missing for parts of the season anyway if he was playing. But... I know Hertha like him, and whether or not they can actually, I don't know. But it could be that Liverpool just keep him. Thing is, we mentioned earlier the youngsters, the likes of Curtis Jones, Leighton Clarkson to a certain degree. But it, it's he's played for two years in the Bundesliga, which is one of the best leagues in the world. You would assume him coming back, and, and I think he's 23, 24 now, him coming back into that Liverpool squad, he will surely be better than any of those youngsters. There's a player on Liverpool's books who they've got and they bought years ago to as an investment, somebody they could obviously in, they think they could improve, whether that would be through training, through playing the under-23s. He was always, whenever I saw him play the under-23, he was way too good for that level, as has been proven by what he's done in the Bundesliga. So he's a decent player. He's like, there's one or two we can make. We've done Harry Wilson in the past, haven't we spoken about him? So he's kind of in the same boat. Harry Wilson's a player who's played for a full season in the Premier League now, almost. So he's, he's shown that he can do it at the highest level. So these are players that, when they were bought or when they were coming through at Liverpool, were seen as, as players that could progress or make an impact in the team. But in the time that it's taken for them to go out on loan, and then by the time they come back, Liverpool have moved on. I mean, there are technically, by definition, no teams better than Liverpool at the moment. So there's no shame and not getting into the Liverpool team, especially when you've been away for two years. But with the, you know, the financial implications of what's going on at the moment, the uncertainty, I mean, there's every chance still Liverpool will take a look at him in the summer and go, well, what can we do with this player? And if he's good enough, Klopp's shown loads of times in the past that he's quite willing to give people a go. He gives people not so much second chances, but he allows people to show their true selves. 
he did it, as we just mentioned, with Carriers of the, of the following season in the summer. He played some of the friendlies. So he gives people the opportunity. Gruich will get his opportunities probably, whether or not they'll be actually be, as Kiva said, because the season might start five minutes after this one. Whether there's actually some friendlies, I don't know. That's going to be an interesting one. But by all accounts, the transfer window might not be closed until the start of October, the you know middle of September, whatever. So there's no real rush for Liverpool to move these players on. May as well, if they're on the books, have a look at them and see how they are. Yeah, Kiva, on the, the point Doyle mentioned right from the start, given how long ago it was that Marco Gruich played for Liverpool, have we not actually even in the time since he was signed seen an evolution and a change in the way Jurgen Klopp wants to set up his side? Because at the beginning it was that heavy metal football pressing from the front, a lot of physical capacity needed, which Gruich quite clearly has, whereas now it seems to be far more about that technical skill set and technical nimble players in that midfield, which dare I say, Marco Gruich may not quite fit the profile of what Klopp initially was looking for in a midfield player. Yeah, definitely. You're right there. There's obviously been a, a tactics evolution and, you know, Gruich was one of the, well, he was the first player Klopp signed. So obviously, you know, Klopp's looked at this player and we know that he admires the player for a long time before he eventually buys them, brings them in. So, you know, there was something about him and I think there is still something about him whether he would fit now in this role. You look at the midfield, you know, we were speaking on Monday about it, how swamped it is with talent. And, you know, even the players that are getting older, they're still doing a job. You know, you look at Milner, for example. Um, you do kind of wonder whether he's got a future at Liverpool. But as Egan says, you know, going going forward into the next season, Liverpool are gonna gonna be tired if it is the the five minutes that we're we're suggesting, you know, go and I think, you know, having, having bodies around will definitely help with that. And I think will Klopp not, he won't have chance in a pre-season to get one last look at him, will he, if, he, if he's to sell him? So maybe does he bring him back and then think, you know, maybe he could make a move in the January, keeping him for a, about three months, you know, wouldn't hurt anyone, would it really? Um, but, you know, he's definitely developed as a player as well, as we've seen, you know, in his time in the Bundesliga whether that translates to how Liverpool have now developed to move forward. You know, this is a, a team that have gone from when Klopp took over to, you know, sort of languishing outside the top four, even outside the top six, you know. And now, you know, Liverpool are the, the dominant team in world football. So, you know, does he have that that brawn to sort of, you know, stick his chest out and be like, you know, I'm I'm taking Jordan Henderson's spot, I'm taking Fabinho's shit here. You know, he needs to be of that ilk to do that because, you know, these are world-class midfielders often overlooked, as we were speaking about on Monday. But, you know, this is one of the best midfields in the world. And it's such a difficult task if players like this are going to be trying to force the way into it. It feels like there's already kind of... It, it's the one place where Klopp likes to rotate. So we know there's definitely chance, you know, to end some minutes there. But whether, you know... He'll, he'll get that chance, you know, I think we'll we'll come to find out, won't we, over the next few months? Yeah, we certainly will. Well, final thing to, to mention on today's podcast, then, is the 28th birthday of a certain Felipe Coutinho. And thankfully for us here on the Blood Red podcast, we've got his number one fan in Sean Bradbury. Sean, he's a player who's constantly, constantly linked with Liverpool. You always sort of see the stories that are, that are getting to and in the echo, we so often get asked here on Blood Red why we talk about Coutinho so much, and it's because there is that interest in him, and it just never seems to go away, does it? No, I, I think with Coutinho, I mean, obviously, you're absolutely right. We do we do write a fair bit about him still, but I, I would always defend that. I think there's 142 million reasons why, really. He's obviously a, a record sale for Liverpool, and the money that was recouped for that rebuilt the current side. So I think he's he's kind of still part of the, of the story that's unfolding before us now. And obviously there's, there's kind of inherent drama in a team spending that much money, i.e. Barcelona shelling that much out and, and it not really working out. And I think obviously, you know, some people buy into that side of it and it's understandable because of the nature of his departure at leaving Liverpool. And I think weirdly, probably he, he's the last player who you could maybe make a case for having left against the club's will possibly. Although obviously the way that Liverpool have channeled it financially and, and in terms of the evolution of the team, you'd struggle to say really they miss him now, certainly as a, as a first team option. But yeah, I'll, I'll always hold a candle for him. Special place in my heart, I think. I'd, I I would say that he's 
probably behind Suarez and Gerard. I think he's he's the, the third most individually talented player I've seen at Liverpool. Although maybe Bobby Firmino is is, is pushing him close now, and obviously there's, there's there's a lot of great players in the current team. But yeah, just just a little message to him on his birthday. Really, I think he's he's at a weird crossroads now, isn't he? It's it's it's, it's so bizarre. I think what's happened to him in the, in the last couple of years and that that last few months where he was at Liverpool. I think was arguably his finest form in a red shirt. He was absolutely motoring, and then obviously you know he left, and 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 we all know the circumstances behind that. But then there's just a weird, a weird thing for him now. He's a bit of a rootless player. Um, you know, it, it's still it's not a bad thing to be a Barcelona player, and he's not actually done that badly there. He's he's won titles, hasn't he? He's done okay at Bayern Munich this season, but it's strange is now how fast football evolves and moves on. I think Liverpool are a testament to that. If you look at someone like perhaps. Nathaniel Klein, you know, a, a youngster's come and reinvented the position almost um, the, the way the team set up has followed him. And, and I think Patilio's almost felt that at, at his last few clubs. You know, he's this tricky kind of ball playing scheme in number 10 who doesn't necessarily fit into how any elite side played, plays at the moment. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my Patilio monologue. But um, wish him well on the day. <laughs> I just wondered, I know you threatened before we, we started recording saying when we get on to Coutinho, you're going to leave us. But just wondered from sort of the insight you can give us whether or not you can ever see a scenario play out where Coutinho does return to Liverpool. I can see a scenario, yeah, but it's not going to happen. The scenario right. would be bringing him back on loan. But does Klopp want to bring him back on loan? Is he a good player? Yeah. Is he a great player? Yeah. Is he a former Liverpool player? Yeah. Has he not played for Liverpool for two and a half years? Yeah. Should we stop going on about him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just careful. By, defi- by definition, how old was he when he left? 25. Must have been 25. Yeah. So he's 28 yeah. now. So he's 28. So and next time, unless, next, he, unless next, he comes back, like. unless he comes back, then please, Liverpool fans, just quietly just watch him on your televisions and just stop mandering us about him. Thank you. All right, brilliant stuff. Thanks for that. Ian Doyle and Kiva, you, you were saying about uh, singing You'll Never Walk Alone and things on Monday's podcast at Anfield. I just wondered if, if it was fitting that we should be there. Well, put her on the spot. No, no, I'm, no, I'm joking, of course. I'm joking. <laughs> but no, just uh, just final say for, for you, Kiva, in terms of Coutinho, just what a player he was for Liverpool and as Doyle says, there is this hankering for him to return, whether it be a loan deal or whatever, but I suppose it is now time to sort of put it to bed and move on, get over him and away we go. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? I think I'm similar to Sean and a lot of fans where, you you know, you'll always hold a place for him in your heart. Um, just because, you know, like he, Sean mentioned, he's in that ilk of Torres, Suarez, Gerard players of true technical ability and class. And, you know, you got so much joy out of watching them, but... Like we mentioned about Marco Gruwich, how Liverpool have tactically, you know, evolved. Liverpool have done the same since Coutinho left and him leaving sort of enabled Liverpool to do that, not only financially to bring in players like Alisson, um, but also, you know, to actually evolve and not, you know, not always have to pass the ball to Phil because he'll he'll be the magician and he'll do something for us. Liverpool don't need that now. Liverpool will go wide. You seen yesterday Van Dijk doing one of his, I like to call them quarterback sort of passes of the ball into Mane. That's getting quite a familiar little trait now. Um, you know, so Liverpool have totally evolved and have had to because you know people are getting used to them and you've got to constantly evolve to stay on top of your game. And um, so I don't think there's really a place for them in terms of that. But having said that, you know he's still a world class player and. I think, you know, you sort of do let your mind wander into imagine Liverpool re sign Coutinho. And I think that's what a lot of fans are doing. That would be some tweet, wouldn't it? It'd be some Facebook post. It'd be like it just it would sort it would break the transfer market in a mad way if 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 Coutinho was to return to Liverpool ever. But you know, I think that that um we've kind of missed missed it now, that sort of moment. You feel like after this somebody's gonna sign for someone. You know, probably he's hoping that. Um, and there's even been talk he might stay at Barcelona. I don't think, you know, well, there's so many reports about him that you just don't know sort of what the future holds for him. But, um, you know, I think I wish him well because, you know, he, he gave us some some good good away days, some good days at Anfield, um, some great memories. And I hope he can, you know, show the sort of mental fortitude we've, we, Carriers will need to show. 
in terms of just owning it now. He needs to go out and be a baller like he was for Liverpool because you know he's he's still still playing for Brazil. That you know the, the World Cup is will be on the horizon again, and you know there'll be there'll be chances for glory for him. And you just you hope that he can he can do that because you, you should never have any sort of bitterness towards him. I don't think it was his dream move, and Liverpool got a lot of money. And then, and then we've got, we've got, we've got, got on, on great things. Great things. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. So, yeah, just 28 a player who you would have expected to be coming into his prime, but at the moment not really got anywhere to, to settle and stay. But that's it from us here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast. Of course, we will be back on Monday. There'll be plenty of podcasts and videos coming across the Blood Red channel across the course of the weekend. But thanks for your time and your company to those listening in or watching in wherever you have been joining us. Until next time, though, bye for now. <laughs>